Hello and welcome to EAJ Today. My name is Gerhard Hendricks and we are here in Barcelona for the uh, annual scientific meeting of the European Society of Cardiology. It's my pleasure to introduce Atul Verma from Canada and Paulus Kirchhoff from Birmingham to you. And we're going to talk about the STAR AF trial which has been presented yesterday for the first time at all uh, in the hotline session. What's the background of STAR AF? What type of study did you do? Well, uh, catheter ablation has emerged as a very effective technique for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, but the results and the techniques for persistent atrial fibrillation are not well known. So we did a randomized trial to compare different techniques of ablation in symptomatic patients with persistent atrial fibrillation. How many patients did you include and what was the randomization, randomization scheme? Different types of therapies? Yes, so there were three arms to the study. Uh, one was pulmonary vein isolation alone, which as you know is the cornerstone for AF ablation. The second arm was pulmonary vein isolation plus electrogram-based ablation. Mm -hmm. And the third arm was PVI or pulmonary vein isolation plus linear ablation. Mm -hmm. And we enrolled 589 patients from 48 centers in 12 countries. What was the primary endpoint of that study and uh, the main results? The primary endpoint was freedom from any atrial fibrillation greater than 30 seconds after one procedure, as per the standard guidelines. And we were actually expecting that the more extensive ablation procedures would actually produce a better outcome. But to our surprise, we actually found that there was no added benefit to the more extensive procedures and that uh, PVI alone, if anything, there was a non-significant trend towards better outcome with PVI alone. Did that surprise you, Paulus? Well, I'm, uh, I think it's important to put this in context. Atul just said that persistent AF ablation has much less data to support its use. But nonetheless, if you, for example, look at the URP survey, 30% of AF ablation procedures are done in patients with persistent AF. So it's an important clinical patient group that we have. Um, I have always been an advocate of pulmonary vein isolation, but to broaden things a bit before that hotline, I did a sort of informal survey of high volume centers in Europe and the US. And it turns out that about a third of them do PVI only in persistent AF patient first ablation. A third of them do PVI plus linear lesions, and a third of them do PVI plus cafe or other uh, types of sort of identifying the substrate. So there is real equipoise, and I think that illustrates how important STAR AF2 is, because now we have some data to guide us. Absolutely. Did you observe any uh, procedural differences, procedure time, complications within the three groups? Yeah, so not surprisingly, the more extensive ablation approaches took more time. In fact, they added an hour to the procedure, which from a patient perspective is very important. And it also increased fluoroscopy exposure by more than 30%, which again, not just from a patient perspective, but also from an operator perspective is important. Absolutely. And when you think about, I mean, this is all, again, hypothesis generating, but when you look at the data on silent brain lesions and even overt stroke after AF ablation, procedure duration and adding additional lines or other lesions is one of the main factors that emerges as a risk factor for such, um, well, are they complications, are they parts of the procedure, but such unwanted effects of AF ablation. So I think that's an important issue and it's probably re related to procedure duration and time of the catheters in the left atrium. What does STAR AF tell us with respect to our perspective on the pathophysiology of persistent atrial fibrillation? What's the impact? I mean, your study uh, clearly showed that isolation of the pulmonary veins, even in persistent atrial fibrillation, gains significant benefit. Looking to, to the game between substrate and drivers, what's the impact of STAR AF in this context? Yeah, so I think uh, like any clinical trial, it always asks more questions than it necessarily answers. So I think we can say that as a 
add-on strategy, lines alone or fractionated electrograms alone may not be the solution. Uh, does that mean n we should never go after the substrate? Absolutely not. Uh, you know, there are definitely other approaches, whether it's going after low voltage regions. Uh, we've been discussing a lot about rotors in the EP community. But I think what this does show is that before we go off and start doing these things, we need to make sure that we're doing right by the patients. Mm. Paulus, uh, putting the the results of STAR AF into the perspective of further studies to come in the field. What, what do you think would be the next step? Where to go from STAR AF, study-wise? Well, the, I think STAR AF challenges a few of our concepts. And that is, for me, the most important thing. We have to go back to the drawing board and think about what do we know about atrial fibrillation? I think we would all agree, and Atul just said that, there are patients who need more than pulmonary vein isolation. But we just have to accept now, and Star AF illustrates that, that we cannot identify those. Um, I would even go beyond. If you look at the, if you look, look at the long-term success rates reported in Star AF, they are not that different to the long-term success rates reported in paroxysmal AF patients. And they aren't even that different to the long-term success rates reported on antiarrhythmic drug therapy after a cardioversion. So my statement would be we have to find clinical markers that differentiate different patients who have different etiologies of AF. We, we all know that AF is sometimes caused by focal firing, sometimes caused by reentry, sometimes caused maybe by inflammation, sometimes caused by abnormal calcium handling, maybe impacted by fibrosis in the atrium. But we ignore that when we take our clinical decisions for now. We just say it's paroxysmal, it's big left atrium, it's persistent, it's short-term duration. These classifiers don't work and we have to develop better ones. And I think that would be the next step. And then have a better trial, a next trial, with different inclusion criteria. You know? But that would include patients in whom we have a good rationale to believe that additional lesions are useful. Looking to the, the uh clinical impact of STAR AF. What is the, the essence for the moment, the take home message for the uh, clinician and the electrophysiologist from STAR AF? Well, I think for the broader cardiology community, I think that it shows that catheter ablation can be an effective approach in persistent AF as well as paroxysmal AF. And this is bridging the evidence gap for uh, persistent atrial fibrillation in particular. I think for the electrophysiologist, however, uh, it makes us think twice, and it makes us think that less sometimes may be more, mm -hmm. and uh, that we've got to keep searching for the appropriate substrate targets. Paulus. Yeah, I think the take-home message is that atrial fibrillation ablation by pulmonary vein isolation is an effective treatment to prevent recurrent AF in persistent AF patients. And that if you have a patient who is in need of catheter ablation for persistent AF, that pulmonary vein isolation alone is a very reasonable first step. And that you can probably then defer other ablation strategies to add on procedures. Gentlemen, thank you very much for this great interview here at EHA today.